Hi there, and welcome to another ClueCon Weekly. This time we're very pleased to have David Bender along from the US of A. How are you doing today, David? Stupendous. How are you, David? Very good. Pleased to have you along. And whereabouts is it that you are in the USA, David? New Jersey. New Jersey. Okay, that's great. And where, whereabouts in New Jersey, just to be specific? Lakewood, New Jersey, smack dab in the middle between north and south, halfway between New York and Atlantic City. Great stuff. Well, it's good to have you along. And uh, we've known each other a good while because I've seen you at various Astricons and ClueCons. Uh, so I know you're a man of VoIP experience. I've seen you speaking at Astricon. And uh, I wonder if before we get into the, the business that you're in, David, perhaps you could give us a little bit of a background about how you got into the crazy world of VoIP uh, and, and uh, when that was as well, because I think you've been, a, been around for quite some time in the industry. Yeah, so I was always a tinker. I always liked technologies. I think I broke more computers than I fixed, but it was a lot of fun pulling, pull, pull, pulling them apart. I was not in the IT business. I was working in EMS in the medical field and I was out for a couple of days and I walked into a friend's shop that had an IT shop and I saw what looked like to me a Fort port modem. And to me, that was a new toy. It was an old PCI card. This was probably back in, I wanna say 2002, 2003. And I said, oh, wow, this is a really cool modem. How does this work? Instead of having one connection, we could have four dial-up connections, 256 kilobits, that's a lot. Um, and he corrected me and said, no, that's not the, a modem, that's actually something for a project called Asterisk. And I said, what's that? And he said, Google it. Um, I Googled it. He showed me a one page manual from somewhere online and I got all excited. This is my, this was, this was my um, second introduction to Linux. The first one was doing basic web hosting. So I, I knew a little bit right. about Linux. I think it was the first box that I got pawned. I didn't know what I was doing. I set it up, username, root, password, root, figured what could go wrong. I think it took all of 30 mm. seconds before it got hit. That was my first introduction to fraud. Um, brought, brought the box up, put in Mod Probe, saw the little green lights on the FXO light up, got all excited, started playing with it, and then it took off from there. And I said, "There's no way this could be that easy." Keep in mind, back then in Asterisk, there were no GUIs; everything was from the command prompt. But mm. still, that was the, one of the easiest things I've ever set up, and started playing with it, and it just took off from there. I just excited, loved it, and it was the first thing I was able to play with, and instantly see a result within a day or two making phone calls. Excellent. Now you said you're from a, an EMS background. So um, having found Asterisk, uh, what kind of made you take the leap and, and put it to work from a business perspective? So I was, it was a matter of just, it was just a hobby. It was just something really, really cool that you played with. And you could actually see you type in a couple of commands, you launch a soft phone and make it work. So in the beginning, I wasn't actually looking for work in that. I, I took a little bit of break to, to figure my life out, actually moved across the world to Israel for a couple of months just to relax, take a little bit of a break. Mm. I was about to move back to the US where somebody offered me a job doing phone systems. And then I was contacted by a company called the Flat Planet Phone Company, which was looking for employees, looking to start a new startup, looking to get off the ground, needed somebody that knew a bit about Asterisk. And I said, oh yeah, I know everything about Asterisk. So they hired me and then I learned everything about Asterisk. And slowly, you know, over time the company grew. So I knew how to start Asterisk. I knew how to write a couple of lines of dial plan. They were using a system that was based on Asterisk. Um, back then, I think it was called they were using Sir, even before it was Open Sir, a little bit of MySQL, a little bit of Apache. So that's how I, that was my formal yeah. introduction, being thrown headfirst into the carrier world. I didn't know what I was getting into. Excellent stuff. Hi, right, well, you've mentioned Flat Planet. Tell us a little bit about what Flat Planet does, David. So there's actually a couple of companies. So the, the, the first primary company that we started off, started off with was called Flat Planet Phone. Not sure what my boss was thinking at the time, but Flat Planet Phone, I guess the idea was the world is flat. Back then, when you want to make international phone calls, it was extremely expensive. And the idea was that we're making the world flat. We're making it globally call anywhere from anywhere to anywhere. The conception back in then in telecom was when you made a phone call, it mattered where you were calling from. And as we know now, it just matters the carrier that you're calling to. So we started off with a small company. We knew we wanted to get into the hosted market. That's, that was right, right, it was right before the dot-com bubble, 2005, 2006. We started getting into the hosted PBX platform. Being that we were based in Israel, we ended up getting a lot of local customers over there. So we slowly somehow got into the foreign exchange market, dealing with a lot of companies that have a lot of clients that buy and sell currency exchanges. Um, then once we got into, into that, they had a need to call over the world. So calling the United States back then was 
fairly simple. I mean, communication still in the United States is not that hard, but then when you're dealing with international, calling people all over the world, making sure call or ID should work. I mean, it's, it's, it's today, it's, 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 it's just taken for granted that you make a phone call and it works, but back then that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So we were looking for options. So my bosses bought a carrier in Cyprus called uh, Omega DSTU Telecom, which their focus was um, more the, not the wholesale market, but more dealing with the bigger, larger carriers. Because when you go international, you have to deal with a lot of big players. So, you know, Verizon, British Telecom, VIX, et cetera, et cetera. Once we did that, we sort of got into the, you know, quality wholesale market. So dealing with a lot of carriers, dealing with the ideas around the world. Eventually, they bought another company in Israel mm -hmm. called 015 Hilo, and then the company grew from there. So we started, I think, in New York with a small data center with two servers. And now we have New York, New Jersey, St. Denis, France, Nicosia, Cyprus, and a pop in Rosh in Israel. So yeah, small little company started with two servers to a uh, global presence. Excellent. That's, a, that's a, a good journey you've been on. Just uh, on the Cyprus, one out of interest. Are you based in the Turkish part or the Greek part? The Greek part. The fun part. Right, right. Okay. I asked because I, I was involved in doing some telecom work in uh, Cyprus once, and it was in the Greek part, but they had um, radio sites because it was mobile network stuff, or was it satellite? One of the two. Anyway, they had... Um, uh bases in the turkish part as well and we had to cross over uh, from one part to the other to go and look at it oh well it sounds like you've been on a bit of a telecoms journey uh david not only in the technology but from a sort of a corporate and a strategic point of view now i know you from astracon and uh, you've come to uh, various astracons and given talks one of the talks i remember you giving was about troubleshooting um and uh, what what is it that made you pick up on that kind of subject to contribute that back to the community? So anything that, so if, if, if you, real quickly, a lot of people take for granted that when they go on Google and they look for a problem, they look for an issue, they're, they're gonna find an answer. Now they're gonna, most of the times they're gonna find an answer on a forum and the reason why they're gonna find it is because somebody else took the time to put out the question, to ask the question and somebody else took out the time to answer it. I'm a very big believer in giving back and that nobody was born knowing what they know whenever we have a new hire, whenever we start out with somebody, instead of talking down and saying, you don't know anything, go to school and learn. And whenever they get discouraged, the first thing that I say to them is, is that we were all born the exact same way. We were all born knowing nothing and everything that we know, we spent time, we worked and we learned on it. So if I learned, you can learn, anybody can learn. So when it comes to troubleshooting, my whole main mantra is one of the things they do at work is, is I want to know about the problems before the customer does. You have some companies that their customers are their notification. And then you have some companies that are very proactive to find the problems before the customers doing the customers shouldn't even know. So starting back in 2005, 2006, when we started, there wasn't a whole lot of information about telecom. VoIP had a really bad name. And I don't think it has anything to do with technology. I think it has to do with the status of the internet back then. And there were a lot of problems. I spent many mm. of days pulling out my hair um, finding a lot of one-off cases. We had time where customers were getting compromised and it took me two whole days of just banging my head against the wall, trying numerous scripts till I figured out how the attackers were getting into the phones. And it was, it was very satisfying to me. And then once I figured it out, it's you know part of my list of things that when customers have a problem or I think they're getting compromised and I want to know how they're getting in, this is the first go-to where I'm able to say, okay, I think this is the exploit they're using and I figured it out. So it's more of, I got a lot from the community um, I, I'm ashamed that some of the emails, some of the questions I had back then, but again, I, I, back, in, uh, back in 2005, 2006, back then I was a noob, I knew nothing. And if I learned something, why should the next person have to go through the same journey of banging their head, let them learn from my experiences. So it's, it's a passion of mine to squash problems before they come up and let other people enjoy the, the same benefits and let it work and why should they have to go through the whole process of banging their head against the wall. Yeah, very community spirited, and that, that you know that is what makes the community great. Is people prepared to share their knowledges, uh, sorry, their knowledge and their experiences? Um, because you know, as you correctly said, we all we're all born the same. We all come to this place from different angles, and so you can't expect everybody to kind of know the same things. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's great, David. Um, what what other kind of talks have you done aside from the troubleshooting ones? So I've done troubleshooting. I've done a couple of talks about fraud. That's a passion of mine. Again, 
back in the day when we started, people had asterisk boxes open. I mean, you still have, I mean, I, I have one set proxy up that gets more calls per day of people trying to get free phone calls out of me than actual legitimate calls. So fraud is a big pain. Um, we have one customer that had a SQL injection on their site and lost $35,000 in 10 hours. Um, Nir Simonovich has had cases Sorry. where people have lost over a weekend a quarter of a million dollars. So that's something that I take personal. And then when I see these guys coming, I love toying with them. I love misdirecting them. I like setting up web servers. Um, and one of my talks, I, had, I put up an Apache server with a 000.cfg, let them think it's a provisioning server. There was no even domain on the server. There was nothing. Somebody was out there looking for it. And they did, I think, 20 million requests in about 23 hours. So I spent the day of their time hitting my server, getting absolutely nowhere. So that's one of the things that um, I'm passionate about is stopping the attackers. Um, the other thing is, is another talk that I gave about is, is, is I, I believe the talk was why is international calling so hard or something like that. There, there's so much at play. There's so many issues when it comes to making phone calls. It's, it's 2020. We take it for granted. We think that we make a phone call. It'll just work. But then when you start walking through all the issues and all the problems, believe it or not, a lot of politics not related to the telecom world but then it bleeds over to the telecom world, you start having problems. I'll, I'll give you an example. Hmm. South, South Africa, for instance, used to have a very moderate cost, what it would cost to call the country. Um, and then there was some kind of skirmish with the, the equivalent of the FCC or the Ministry of Communications there, where all the carriers basically high one over them. And they said, yes, you could regulate our rates, what we're going to charge inside the country, but it's not up to you to re regulate the rates of <clears throat> sorry, how much it's going to cost to bring in calls out of the country. So overnight, the rate went up, I think it was 8x, 800% for what it would cost That's us to call, to call South Africa. So then the problem that you then have is everybody using free routes, everybody using GSM gateways ends up being a problem. Now we're talking with, I'm not going to name the carriers, but we're talking with the big tier one carriers even they, although they say it's all white routes connected directly to in-country, even they're having problems. So we are, they're going to be sending a phone call and magically our customers hear a message saying, you don't have enough money on your account. Think that they ran out of their balance with us. Mm. And it turns out somebody's sending the calls to that country using a GSM gateway to lower their costs. So you would think as time progresses, we would get better and better quality. But unfortunately, it's, it's, it's like a whack-a-mole. Every single time you fix one problem, another one creeps up. We just had recently an issue to a country, the Philippines, where again, my only solution was to find a local carrier. The last few days we've been using them, we've been very, very happy, but it's a matter of, and then this also comes back again to the troubleshooting is writing all the software, writing all the scripts, looking at your ASRs, looking at your ACDs, looking at the reports, making sense of them to just keep up and make mm. sure your, qual your quality is there because if your customers aren't happy, they're going to go elsewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. So now you mentioned security being a, a pet subject of yours, and you mentioned that you uh, uh, occasionally play the, the scammers or the would-be scammers along. And when you said that, it made me think of the YouTube videos you watch where people um, kind of fight back. And uh, one of my particular favorites is when the guy is cashing in the, the, the voucher codes. Uh, I think, I don't know whether it's Target or Walmart vouchers or something, or eBay, but the, the, the guy, the, the called person who's meant to be the subject of a scam is actually on the, you know, on the, on the offensive. Um, and have you, have, uh, what experiences have you had there? Do you find the scammers are resilient people or once you've kind of played them, do they run off? So when I, this, there's two things here. So number one, when, I, when I'm talking about playing them, I'm talking about setting up, be just putting servers out there, letting them think they got into something, letting them think they got phone calls. Like all my ASA servers, I, I do, work and then I have stuff that I do on the side. I build custom solutions on the side. Every single server by default is set up that any call that you send me will automatically answer and make believe like it's going somewhere. So as a free public service, whatever, so long as my clients let or for my own boxes, if you send me a call, I will take it and you will think you're getting somewhere and I will waste your time by default right. because I'd rather them hit me and I know what I'm doing than hitting some other poor guy that doesn't know what they're doing. And unfortunately, you still have a lot of people like that where using A100, past 100 for their SIP account is still perfectly fine. As far as scammers, so I actually won a prize, I think both at Astrocon and at ClueCon, where in the United States, we have the IRS scammers, the, um, the, the, the card scammers, they basically they try to get you to give them codes. So th th these numbers are readily available. You could go on Twitter and find these numbers. So one of my demos actually built the system 
um, like I said, KuCon and AstroCon, where I went ahead and pounded their phone lines and I wrote an algorithm to change their phone numbers. So they, if you call them too often, they just block you. And I pretty much maxed out their phone lines and then people were trying to call and they just couldn't get through because I, um, I blocked them. So I don't toy with them. I just make sure that nobody else could get through to them. So they just, you, they just shut down their phone lines because they're not getting any work done, which is exactly what I want. That's a great public service right there, David. Top class. Um, now, uh, actually, uh, you just as an aside, have you come across um, Fred Posner's project, the APIban.org project? I've seen it. I haven't, I haven't integrated with it. I should. I haven't played with it enough. I just don't have time for all my little pet projects. If I did, I wouldn't make any money. But I did see yeah. it. I did sign up for it. I never actually um, went ahead and implemented it. Yes, because he, he, like you, he's got some honeypot PBXs out there, you know, that attracts these people. And then he logs their IP addresses. And, the, and the, the, the most succinct way I can think to describe it, it's like a fail to ban. They call, not after they call, or before they try, I should say, because what it does is takes the, the IP addresses of the bad actors trying to climb on his honeypot PBXs and puts them into a list that uh, then blocked from calling into any system that's protected by it. Anyway, just an aside, uh, we ought to have Fred back on at some stage on ClueCon Weekly. We've had him on before talking about it. It'd be nice to get an update now that uh, we're a few months in. Now, you mentioned that you won uh, prizes at both um, Astrocon and ClueCon, and yet I believe, uh, David, that from a professional point of view, virtually all your implementations are asterisk. Is that correct? Everything is asterisk. I've limited to toying around with free switch to help customers. I, I, one of the many things I keep promising myself I'm going to learn, like I said, I've set it up, I've ran it, I've, I've played with it. I have the book, I read it, but that's been my, um, the max that I've unfortunately that I've ever done with, with uh, free switch is setting up conferencing and saying, Hey boss, so you do really cool stuff with this, but the switch that we're using is using asterisk. So primarily I'm, I'm an asterisk man. I've been doing it since like 2003, 2004. And it's really hard to change your habits. So as an asterisk man, David, what is it you get from coming to ClueCon? Because you're quite a regular at ClueCon. So it's the, the shows are not just about the underlying technology that that particular show is about. So asterisk is not just, AstroCon is not just about asterisk. And ClueCon is not just about free switch. So going to ClueCon, you meet a lot of people in the industry. You make a lot of good friendships. I remember one year I met Michael Marutis from Voicetel. I came in, I didn't know anybody. It was my first year. I was very, very shy. I was speaking to Brian. I met him previous years at Astrocon. And I said, you know, who here could I know? And he invited me to Michael. Became very good friends with him. Use him now as vendor. We hang out. You meet a lot of people in the industry. And it's like, it's not just about free switch. It's about what everybody else is doing. And then you also see the trends of the technology where it's going to be going. So I believe it was Mr. Rosenberg, I've got his first name, who was talking about a new protocol last at the last ClueCon about Quick which is, is, is far off, it's not around, it's not going to happen anytime soon, but you know it's in the pipeline. The way I learned about that and the way I knew about that was by coming to ClueCon. So ClueCon is not just about one specific technology, it's about the technology in general. You're going to have more about free switch because it's, it's, it's being ran by the free switch gang. So you're going to learn, you hear more about that than about Asterisk, but every demo that I did up there was about Asterisk because that's what I know, but it's not, like I said, it's not just specifically about free switch. It's about all telecom related technologies. Very much so. We welcome people from all over the open source communications space, you know, whether they're hardcore web RTC webby people or whether they're involved in other projects like Asterisk or Kama Ilio or Open SIPs. Everybody is welcome at ClueCon. And uh, before we get on to talking about ClueCon this year, which we'll round off with, um, David, uh, what are your favorite things about ClueCon? You, you said that you've gained in terms of um, meeting people from within the industry and that actually hooked up with the carrier that you use now by coming to ClueCon. But uh, tell us about some of your favorite things about ClueCon aside from the talks. The people there, it's a very relaxing environment. Um, it's just it's just hanging out with friends and you learn like I said, the, the, the thing, I, it's not just the talks it's people that you that you meet a lot of, some of the talks do come repetitive but you know there's a group of people that like-minded people it's it's a lot of fun to hang out the parties are very very good um the um playing the card games i remember one year i forgot the name of the game something against humanity but it was it was a, it was a lot of fun a lot of hanging out till all hours like meeting new people from all around the world and 
just from regular conversations, learning about everything that's going on. It's just, it, it's, the talks is a big thing of it because you, you learn and then you hear one thing, your mind races, you hear something else, and then you, you really pick up a lot. And I, every single year I come back to my boss with a, I'll say a Google Doc of maybe 15, 20 different things that we could do better that year of new things that everybody else is going to be doing. And if we don't get in the bandwagon and start following, we're going to be way behind the pack. So it's, 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 it's a lot of learning. It's, it's could be exhausting only because of how much you're getting in, how much you're learning, but you really pick up a lot of what's going on as well as you make a lot of fantastic connections. Yeah, I think you've summed that up very, very well. Now, am I right in thinking that you had to go at karaoke on one of the clue cons? Is that right? No, I you, will not, you, will, you will not catch me dead singing. <laughs> you, will, you, must, no one, you must have just been in the karaoke room then, David. I was watching everybody else fail miserably. I, there's no <laughs> amount of booze in the world that will get me up there on a stage and sing. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the social side and the people because I know that uh, Sharon and Abby and Jill and uh, the whole team that organize ClueCon go out of their way to engineer all of these social situations. And so it looks like it just happens, but actually there's a lot of work gone into making those uh, facilities available, thinking like the Signal Wire Lounge last year and uh, other events and uh, as you said some of them are music related and then of course there's the boat trip as well everybody I loves to get that, on yeah. onto the uh onto the lake yes um I, now I, clue con sorry I go actually, ahead i actually flying back for me it's hard they usually end up taking the, the, the morning flight back on friday morning the first year i missed the boat tour then i regretted it and every year thereafter i make sure to get up and the flight that i have to get on a six o'clock flight so i, I gotta leave the I gotta leave the hotel maybe at four or five in the morning but every single year, I actually stay over just for the boat tour, just for how relaxing it is. And it's just the, getting your last clicks and meeting new people. And without fail, every single year, the, the, the boat tour, doesn't, it, it always surprises. It's always, it's always very, very good. It is. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And of course, people are a little bit more relaxed because they've done their talks or they've manned their stand or whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, and even the organizers can breathe a bit of a sigh of relief because it's mainly over by then. And uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, a really good time. Now, ClueCon this year, of course, uh, in common with lots of events, has had to go online. We're calling it ClueCon Deconstructed, and it's going to be online between August the 4th and August the 6th. We're very much uh, looking forward to that. Um, are you planning to attend, David, this time around? It depends where the pandemic is holding. Right now, we're all still, I'm one of the few that are still held up at home. So, it's literally touching every single day. I hope by then we're going to be out, but it really depends on, you know, how things are going. At the very least, I'm going to try to have it on in, in the background, you know, attending and watching it. But literally everything is today is, is day by day. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yes, we're planning. We've got some great speakers lined up. And we've also got karaoke. We have got karaoke. I know you said you wouldn't participate uh, in that, but we've got online karaoke. We've even got a music jam room because you all know one of the famous parts of uh, clue con is Tony getting one of his guitars out and shredding a bit of axe uh, with with other people. Um, so uh, something to look forward to for everybody, and and also the code of games. You remember the participation events that we have. Um, that's gone online as well, and uh, we'll be talking about that. In fact, we talk about it every Friday um, in cluecon.cantina.video at 10 a.m. Central. We've got a little hangout there where we get together. Now, we're coming towards the end of our time together, David. But before we part ways, um, what what things do you see in the future of the industry that you're in, uh, whether that's just around the industry or around the technology? What what does your, uh, your future sensing mechanism see at the moment? I think you're going to see a lot of more direct platforms out there. For instance, you have WhatsApp, you have Facebook calling, you have, well, Viber's been out for a while. You have a lot of that direct. So you have a lot of direct communications at the same time, and which I think is also going to be, you have a lot of disruptions in, in, in the regular telecom world. Well, the regulations, like I said, what happened in South Africa was just a mirror of what happened earlier in Europe, where if you're calling in Europe, the rates now are much lower, but if you're calling outside of Europe, it's much harder. So I think that the, the way, unfortunately, the politics of the world and the way communications work, it's going to push a lot more peer-to-peer, -peer, a lot more online. Mm -hmm. and I said with the quick protocol, it's going to push us everybody more going more and more direct. And I see the big telcos. On one hand, they can have all the infrastructure. It's going to go more to the internet. But I, I see the PSDN slowly 
dying a painful death, which is not the worst thing in the world because good riddance to all the carriers in the middle that just make problems. <laughs> and, and what about um, Stir Shaken? Is that something that's on your radar just yet? So we're already working on it right now. We already applied. We already applied to get a cert. We're working on it right now. I think from all the issues I've seen talking about troubleshooting and seeing large MTU packets, I think it's it's not going to be as fairly simple as everybody thinks it's going to it's going to be. I hope it's going to cut down the amount of calls I get. I think about 50% of the calls that I get on my cell phone are coming from such numbers. I know that it's definitely shaking up the industry already. Um, I'm not going to name which one it was. But one of the big tier one carriers in the world sent us a notice last month that the American market is no longer worth it because of the amount of traffic that they get globally from these scammers, the amount of work that they're going to have to put in for the small margins that they're going to get to send the phone calls to the United States, they just bailed out and you can no longer even send them phone calls to take to the United States. So I'm, I'm hopeful over there, it's going to help out. I would love to see it work on a global scale. So it's not like in America, yeah, we're taking care of ourselves. From what I understand, Europe doesn't have that problem, but you, you have a lot of apps out there that are geared to stopping spam. So it is it is, it is a problem in the other industries. So I would love to see it being adopted on a global scale. And like I said, if everything is going to be more in an IP world, and you'll be able to see where the traffic is coming from, it'll be a lot more easily identifiable to see, you know, certificates and see where the, where the calls are coming from. And then if you see a bad actor, you just take them out. Another thing is IPv6, which I know a lot of people don't talk about. We're in the process of finally, we, we, we've had it on the network for a while, but we're starting not to push it onto clients, hopefully. And right. from the limited tests that I've been seeing, yes, the, the big IPs are scary in the beginning, but once you get used to them, you, you eventually start memorizing your ranges, just like you remember your V4 ranges. And I think that's also going to help in, in doing a lot more of di direct connectivity. We're not going to have to worry so much about a lot, a lot of NAT devices in between hurting us and, and, and breaking us. Good advice, David. Good, good advice. Now, during the conversation, we came uh, across the fact that in terms of your Astricon speeches, you see that as part of giving back to the community to pass on the things that you've learned um, and things that you've experienced. I wonder if in closing, you could talk a little bit more about that kind of giving back, not only what you've given back, and, and maybe there are other examples in addition to the uh, talks. I don't know whether you've contributed documentation or anything like that, but if you could also outline some general ways that other people could give back as well. Maybe they're not prone to giving talks at conferences. What other ways could people give back? Whatever, whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever you're in your comfort zone, if it's, you know, even installing Asterisk and trying to get it to work and then you find problems, even if you're not going to be able to find the solution, the fact that if you find the bug helps it for the next person that's going to find the problem. I just was on the Asterisk email list the other day. I found the problem. I found a workaround to fix it. You don't have time to follow up, but I actually wrote an email saying, even though I found a workaround, the issue, from what I understand, it is a bug, and I do plan on reporting it, even though it's not hurting me, because it's going to hurt the next person. And if I could save somebody mm. else the grief of work, spending two, three, four days working on a problem, and I fixed it, and I'm able to have it, that they won't have that problem, it'll make their life easier. So it could come to just basically testing the software. It could be sitting in IRC. It could be going on forums. It could be documentation. It could be whatever you're comfortable with. Just recognize that open source is not something, although it is free, it's not something that we should all just take for granted and use because if there's nobody contributing back. There goes the community. The community is only as strong as the people contributing to it. So for me, I'm not that versed in free search, but when I do come to Klucon, I do like speaking to people. I do like giving people ideas, like a tool that I use is VoIP monitor. So if I know to use it very well. I tell the people about it, they should, should, they should use it. Like I said, I've done talks. If you're not comfortable with talks, any little bit, just when the next person has a problem, whatever experience you have, even if it's simply like I said, asking a question in the forum, when somebody answers that, when somebody answers that question, the next person that's going to go ahead and Google it is going to find that. I was dealing with an employee recently that said, well, I don't want to ask on forums because I feel like I'm just taking them, not giving. And my response was, yeah, in theory, if you had time, we would like you to go ahead and respond back. But if you're just asking that question, someone else is gonna probably Google that exact same question. And now your question is gonna be contributing to helping the next mm. person. So whatever it is that you feel comfortable doing, whatever part of it is, don't just be a taker, but give some back to the community. People before you have come and helped out, people are gonna come after you and just have the ecosystem keep going round and round. You help one person, they're gonna help the next person, pay it forward and everybody will keep helping out each other. Excellent, yeah, I've, I've never really um, considered the the asking of the question has been a service to the community, but now you explain it like that, I see that. And uh, yeah, all sorts of different um, things
things that people can do. And uh, I think one of the, the, the great themes that you've picked up there, David, is whether it's documentation or testing or code contribution or, or whatever it might be, it's going above and beyond your own narrow sphere of interest. It's giving back, you know, outside uh, of uh, those parameters. Well, thank you very much for, in fact, this has been a part of your giving back, David, coming back uh, and talking to the community now. We're grateful to have had you along. And uh, I hope I get to see you at ClueCon D. That will be a rewarding thing. But in the meantime, is there anything you'd like to say in closing? No, I love see I love seeing the community every single year. It's sad that we can't see them. Hopefully next year we'll uh, be back at it again and we'll be seeing each other. That's great. All right. Well, David, thank you very much for coming along. And uh, I'll see you next time round. Thank you very much for having me. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.